at the end of the day, we're dealing with a patient and we're dealing with the patient's needs and wants. We've got to be cognizant of the fact that a lot of people do not like their appearance. Mm. That affects their mental health, mental state. And if that means taking some enamel off a tooth, then I've got no problems taking that enamel off a tooth. Absolutely. You know, you ask any dentist at the moment, what's the biggest problem we're facing in dentistry? And it's probably increase in wear, increase in temporal mandibular joint problems. Now we've got the Align Bleach Bond culture with Invisalign, which I feel is a phase. I feel it's a phase. I mean, people would argue it's probably not, but I mm. feel it is because once all this starts to fail, which is what I'm seeing coming through the door, we're going to have to start correcting this again with ceramics. I think people tend to say with composites, oh, well, it's reversible. Mm. And it's not. Guys, welcome to Dentistry Unmasked. Very recently, I had a very, very interesting conversation with Paul Tipton. Paul Tipton is uh, one of the most important mentors that I've ever had in dentistry, and he needs no introduction, but Paul qualified from the University of Sheffield and very, very shortly after graduating, uh, started his MSc at the Eastman Dental Institute. Upon finishing his MSc, he opened up a private practice in Manchester City Centre, and very shortly after, founded Tipton Training. Now, as you know, Tipton Training has been uh, the industry leader with regards to private postgraduate training for now over three decades here in the UK. And not only does he train dentists here in the UK, but he trains dentists worldwide and works with the CAP Institute in Dubai as well. Recently, Paul was uh, given the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Private Dentistry Awards, which was well, well deserved. So we had a fantastic conversation from all things clinical uh, to, you know, his, his background. And please check out the conversation we had. Very, very interesting. Paul. Welcome to Dentistry and Mass. Thank you so much uh, for giving up your time today. Um, pleasure. Absolute pleasure. No, thanks for coming. And uh, I just want to get it out there, first of all. Uh, I am tipped and trained. I've done all of your courses. Mm, you and Paul, you've changed my life. And uh, thank you for everything that you have uh, you know, taught me and, and, the, and the knowledge and the wisdom you've given me. Even talking, you know, just before we started rolling, you've already changed my perspective where I'm going to go for the next 10 years. <laughs> it's called experience. That's what well, it is. I've got all of that. Love well, that. absolutely, Paul. And uh, you know what? Thank you again. Uh, absolute titan of the industry. Uh, so thanks for coming to talk to us. Pleasure. Uh, so... Um, I'm just going to start, if we can start with uh, the early years. The so early years, okay. ev ev Even before dentistry. So um, well, there, was a, there was a career, wasn't there? Yeah, so uh, the love of, uh, of my life, apart from my wife, uh, <laughs> has always been cricket. Cricket. Okay, so I went up through the junior ranks, uh, Lancashire under-15s, Lancashire under-19s. I played for England under-19s. Wow. Uh, and I went on to the Stafford Old Trafford. Uh, and my aim in life, and, and we all have a few regrets, and I'll tell you one of my regrets in a minute. My aim in life at that stage at, uh, at school mm -hmm. in the first year sixth, talking to careers officers, um, my aim was to be a professional cricketer, and that was it. So uh, at, un at school, I wasn't particularly academic, middle of the road, right. um, and they all thought, right, okay, what can this guy do? Um and because I was playing pretty good cricket, England under-19s at that stage, you know, the masters know you, the headmaster knows you, so you can have a better conversation with them, really. So my father and I are having conversations about, okay, well, what should he do? He wants to be a professional cricketer. And the chemistry master, and Mr. Cassie, I always remember him, mm. he said, why don't you think about dentistry? Because you're scientifically based, you're doing that science sort of subjects. And with dentistry, you can do locums. So you can do a six-month locum, play your cricket, do another six-month locum, play your cricket. And I thought, that suits me. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that. So uh, so I applied to dental school. Just um, off that recommendation? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Had no reason to want to do it. I was pretty good with my hands. Dentistry sounded a, a really good proposition. Hadn't got a clue what it was about. Didn't really think I'm going to look in somebody's mouths uh, for the rest of my life. I might get shut in a room for seven, eight hours a day looking in people's mouths seven, five days a week. So that didn't come to me at all. It was cricket, 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 mm. and I've got a profession on the side, mm. which is great. So um, got my A-levels done, 
um, was about to go off to Sheffield. Lancashire um, offered me a contract. So I said yes. So I took a year off um, from university. Um, went and played full-time at Lancashire. Um, didn't play in the first team, but got my second team county cap, which was a big thing in, in the first year. And this is one of my regrets now. My One of my regrets was that I didn't postpone my university for maybe another year or two, which I could have done at that stage. It was fairly easy. Mm. Um, and try cricket out because I got to a certain level and I decided then after that one year to go to Sheffield and Lancashire kindly invited me when the holidays were on to come back and do you know, June, July, August, that sort of thing on the staff. So I'd be doing dentistry half time and half of the summer I'd play on the staff. Sounded great. All that happened was that I was sort of at this level at, at Lancashire and the next year, I didn't start until June, mm -hmm. middle of June, okay? By which time all the other guys had gone like that. So I was starting from down here and they were already at that stage. Uh, and by the time I sort of got into the season, got practicing, got myself what we'd call in, dentistry, in, in uh, cricket in good nick and was playing well, end of the season. Mm -hmm. And then I go back to university and I'd start again the next s summer, the next June, uh, end of June, all the other cricketers had again done that. So at the end of the course, when I qualified 1978, I was still there and everybody else, my counterparts were there. And it was, yeah, I'm, I don't think this is gonna work for me. Mm -hmm. By which time uh, at university, I'd love dentistry, fiddling with my hands, seeing patients, I was really getting into dentistry. Okay. And I think that helped my dentistry because um, I grew up with the ethic. You know, if you play sport, you've got to have a good work ethic. You got to be physically fit. You got to work at your fitness, work at cricket, and be you know there all the time working hard. And I think I took that through from cricket into dentistry. And I've always been a, you know, a hard worker. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the number of hours I put into everything I do. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So you know that was my my real passion mm. uh, was cricket. And I saw at the same time the other guys that I'd played with at England under 19s yeah. who'd done full time uh, cricket were now playing for England. Uh, we're, we're playing for the counties in a couple of years' time. We're captain the counties. Mm -hmm. So it's my one regret. I maybe should have given cricket another year or two to see if I could have made it. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, what was the um, uh, the reason then to, to, to you know supplement that with, with, with the degree? Why did you not just go full? Why did no, you I just think, think I'm just going to go parents, full? Parents, I think my yeah. father was... was <laughs> my father was... Uh, I won't say a strange man. He had a, he, had a, he was an interesting character. Right. So my dad was a professional wrestler. Wow. Okay. Um, and also part time actor on TV, mm -hmm. but mostly professional wrestler, part time actor, and he had a building business. So he did you know, three things. So like me, I've inherited doing lots of things. Um, but he was very much and self educated, mm. as in non educated, mm. and very much no, you get a degree. And with him being a wrestler, he's a big lad. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he wasn't the sort of person he went and said, "No, I'm not going to do that." Right. So you know, I so, follow what yeah what Dad said. So it was Dad's Dad's influence then. So yeah, that's why absolutely. He had to do it. And uh, and it's it's worked out. Yeah, switch wood. Well, well done. definitely we no, It's definitely worked out. It's More worked than out worked pretty well. Out. But it's interesting to see how uh, how you mentioned there that you transfer those skills to be a professional sportsman over into your career. Yeah, yeah, hard you work. Because it's graft. hard work and it's hundred miles an hour, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Guys, as you know, I am the lead tutor of the Hedro Academy Vertical Preparation course. Now, we have put together this beautiful vertical preparation kit, which has been beautifully made by former dental suppliers. Simon at Former has kindly agreed to give one lucky winner uh, of this podcast a kit completely, completely free of charge, uh, which retails normally at £220 plus VAT. So all you have to do to win one of these fantastic vertical preparation kits is just give us a like, uh, subscribe to the podcast and share it and leave a comment below and we will pick one lucky winner every podcast and uh, Burkitt will be finding itself uh, in your clinic. Okay, so yeah, great guys. The Horacle Burkitt by Hedro Academy and former dental supplies.
when you qualified then what did the landscape look like when you qualified what so it's interesting when i qualified yeah. sheffield mm -hmm. um my first job was in doncaster so there was a, a a bit of a pioneer a guy called peter robinson who uh i will always be thankful for he gave me my first break my first job and he owned about 12 or 15 practices. Wow. So he's a mini, you know, he's a corporate when corporates weren't around. Mm. Uh, in and around all of Doncaster, in the mining villages, Harworth, Rossington, um, places like that. Uh, and he gave me my first job. Um, very nice guy. Uh, and, you know, became friends with him you know, for a few years after. But the job was in the mining towns, mm -hmm. and it was not what I thought dentistry was going to be about. Okay. So all I was doing, so my first job was, number one, over a butcher's shop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it was a tiny <laughs> one room over a butcher's shop. Um, no heating. So you had to put, you know, warm clothes on to work there. Middle winter, we're now in, in your part of the woods, as in the you know Yorkshire area, gets pretty cold. Mm -hmm. So it's snowing. Um, miners were coming in um, in a T-shirt, middle winter. I got a scarf around myself. You know, they were big lads. They were hard lads. Uh, they didn't want fillings. They mm -hmm. just wanted tooth sure. extractions. Um, difficult to even think about this now, but I used to have many a father come in with uh, his daughter, who's going to turn 21 shortly, oh, okay. saying, will you take all the teeth out, please, and give us some beautiful new dentures. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, my God, you know, but that was, you know, how life was. It's caused better dentistry of the day, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the first smile so, makeover. So, <laughs> well, yes, yeah. So, uh, so I didn't enjoy that at yeah. all. Um, and that's when I decided I would take a break. Mm -hmm. So I'd done 12 months. Took a break and went off then that following winter to Perth um, wow. in Australia and decided I'd play six months cricket in Perth. Mm -hmm. uh, I managed to get a job with um, school dental service in, in Perth. So, you know, a pretty part time, not very pressurized. You know, I could get off early to go to cricket nets and, and that sort of thing. So I had a lovely six months of um, thinking again. We'll talk about this later, maybe about um, pausing business pausing life and thinking okay where do I want to go so I had that taste of dentistry in Doncaster and I knew that wasn't for me that dentistry wasn't for me so what am I going to do so I enjoyed myself six months at a lovely time staying in a place called Scarborough um, on the coast beautiful absolutely gorgeous so I was six months there came back and decided that I wanted to go and work in Manchester so I'm a Manchester lad mm -hmm. and decided that I wanted to try out um Manchester got a job in the city centre of Manchester. Um, fifty percent of the practice was private, fifty percent was NHS. I was the NHS part, so my principal was totally private, mm -hmm. um, and I was doing NHS. But I was dealing with people <clears throat> who wanted to keep the teeth, dealing with people who were happy to you know, and all NHS, but wanted the crown, wanted the inlay, wanted the white fillings, etc., because they wanted to keep the teeth. So mm. I really, really started to enjoy my dentistry. Um, bolt out of the blue. I'd been there 18 months, two years, doing really well, getting on with the staff, loving the patients, doing a little bit of private work now, just touching on it. Uh, bolt out of the blue, the guy that owned the practice uh, was a, a, an Israeli guy, said, and he was probably, what, 42, 45 at the time, mm -hmm. said, I'm leaving, I'm going to go to Israel, I'm going to work on a kibbutz and I'm going to put something back to the Israeli people. Wow. Uh, and that was like, right, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, I want to sell you the practice. Well, it was, well, I, mean, I had no intention of buying a practice. So I'm 27 at the time, something like that. And uh, I said, well, I, I can't afford to buy a practice. I've got no money in the bank. I enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. He said, don't worry. I'll organize the finance for you. My brother-in-law works for, no, his cousin works for CL Bank Netherlands at the time, central Manchester. He'll organize. He knows the practice. He knows what you're taking on. He'll finance you. And uh, I'll offer it you at 50% of the normal price. Wow. And 
he did that because we got on well, number one. Yeah. Also, number two, he had to leave. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, who else is going to buy this? Um, um, and he tried a few people. So it was 50%. Come on, let's do it. Mm. So I found myself with a private NHS practice. I then inherited his private patients. So I'm now totally private. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what do I do? Because my skill set was NHS. Mm -hmm. um, and these patients were coming in paying a lot of money and wanted very high quality. They were very demanding. And I felt totally out of my depth. Wow. Um, and that's when I decided, made a big decision, that I would go into the back of the British Dental Journal, where courses were, and there were nowhere near as many courses as, as there are now. And uh, I would literally ring every single course and do it and really upskill over a short period of time. So over a six month period, I probably must have done, in terms of day courses, about seven or eight day courses, um, trying to upskill, okay? And one of them was a, a guy called Michael Wise, mm. who um, did a one day course on occlusion. Uh, at the end of his one day course on occlusion, I went up to him and said, love the day, but didn't really understand much of it. Yeah. Uh, and he said, well, I do a 12-month course. Why don't you come down to London and I will teach you on this 12-month course all about restorative dentistry, how to do it properly, how to do it privately, and occlusion. So I went and trained with him then for three years. So I did first year with him, second year with him, third year with him. And at the end of the third year, he then said, well, well Paul, next stage for you to do an MSc. So I went off to the Eastman and did an MSc. Hmm. And that was my sort of, I suppose, early years and the way that my my career went. Yeah. What were the um, courses like at the time then? Because, I mean, you mentioned all the courses in the back of the BDJ, and obviously it's not like it is today. But uh, Mike Wise stood out to you. Was there any other sort of like year-long things like that? No. Or was he like the he pioneer He was the only year-long course. Yeah. There were clinical attachments you could do yeah. those days. So I did a clinical uh, attachment in Perio. Yeah. with uh, a consultant in Bristol called Marsh Midder. Right. Uh, and that meant that every uh, one day per week for three months, he went down and did perio you know, as a, uh, uh, with a consultant. So you were like a free of charge dentist mm -hmm. working underneath him. Uh, I did that. I did a, a three-month uh, clinical attachment with Professor Johns at Sheffield on implants. Uh, as well as doing, you know, I did a hands cure uh, what, what, course on posts. What, what, what year is that with the implant? So we're going now to 1986. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's you getting implants into... Implants sort of just with a, sort of, I uh, think, inverted commas, just come out. Right. Um, and the world was getting to know implants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went over and Prof. J Professor Johns, again, who I knew personally, um, he said, yeah, come on over. We started doing implants and, you know, we'll do it together and I'll teach you a little bit and you can help see patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Mike Wise, Mike Wise was the effective the first year-long yeah. restorative. He was the, yeah. yeah, he was the... The only person that did a year-long restorative course, mm -hmm. and he was the, um, I'd say in Verticom, was the guru of restorative dentistry at the time. Yeah, uh, he'd written books for the BDJ and was known to be uh, the highest charging. He was in, um, he wasn't on Harley Streets, he was on one of the other streets next to Dev uh, Devonshire Place. Right, that's where he was. Um, so he was uh, charged the biggest prices and had the best clientele. And, uh, you know, you learn from the best. And, and that's why I thought, right, he's the guy, best reputation, I'm going to try and learn from him. Mm -hmm. And one of the basics of, of business, um, as I'm sure you know, is do what other people do. Find somebody who does it well mm. and mirror him. Yeah. Just mirror what he does. And, again, we teach this business-wise on the courses. Yeah. Find yourself a mentor. Watch what he does, how he west works, how he dresses, how he talks to people, et cetera. Copy, 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 copy. So Mike Wise was the big influence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The initial influence, yeah. Yeah, amazing. So um, you had your practice, which you didn't intend. So I had my practice yeah. in, in um, Market Street in Manchester. Yeah. And the dilemma was then I was going to go down to do a two-year degree uh, at the Eastman in restorative dentistry. 
<clears throat> and uh, how do I fund it? So I decided to sell that practice. Wow, so you just yeah. sold it? Sold it. Um, I sold, I had a, a nice townhouse by that time in Altrincham. Hmm. So I sold the house and moved into a terraced house. And the month before I started the course, I got married. So a lot of things happening at once. Mm. But between myself and my wife, we decided that we'd rather have the same lifestyle that we'd been accustomed to, but trade down in terms of house, mm. put that money in the bank, and really enjoy my time at the Eastman. And, you know, I had a great time. And the Eastman, Mike was my initial sort of guru, but then the Eastman, you know, you can say uh, he cut me and you know i will bleed eastman uh so the eastman at that time was was an amazing place yeah and uh i had such a great time there learning yeah um and learning should be fun and it was really fun hard work but fun uh and uh i went down and did it two years there was that full time then? it was part time mm. but i decided that i would do uh so it's it supposed to be two and a half days a week i decided i'd do four days because uh I sold my practice, yeah, and so I thought I'll throw myself into this. Yeah, that's amazing. So once you finished then that MSc, uh, was it back into the practice world? Yeah, or? so it was yeah. back, and it was then uh, a friend of mine said there's a retiring dentist in uh, central Manchester, a guy called Harold Morley, who had a beautiful private practice, done so well out of it. He'd gone into not housing, he'd gone into mining, and creating horse boxes. So he created the first horse box that was a caravan motorhome. Right. So he went into producing motorhomes for the horsing fraternity. And there's a lot of money in that area. Right. A lot of money. So he produced these motorhomes and also went into mining, uh, bought himself a, a share, uh, and not just a small share, a big share, in a mine in Africa. And so dentistry was now completely out of it. So his practice hadn't run for about three years. It was still there, and it was just doing nothing. It was sitting there. All these files were there, mm -hmm. uh, and he had a receptionist who was his PA, and he went in once every few weeks just to say hello or re-cement a crown for a personal friend, but he wasn't working it. Um, so I got wind of that and went to see him and told him of my ambitions. I've done the Eastman. I want to do this, this, this. I want to create a referral practice. Um, at that stage, referral practices in Manchester, no, no. I spoke to one or two respected older Manchester dentists and said, you know, these are my plans, never work. Um, Manchester people don't refer their business. Okay, well, I'm still going to try. Mm -hmm. So uh, I bought this practice um, and initially sent out letters to all the patients. Half of them were dead, half of them moved away. But I got enough to get me to two days a week. Mm -hmm. um, the practice cost me five thousand uh, pounds, and that was just no goodwill, and that was just for old equipment. Yeah, literally take on the lease, old equipment, five grand. Okay, off we is, go. Is that is that because you know putting into perspective, is that is that cheap? Is that good money or is that that is was cheap as chips? Yeah, yeah. So what were the yeah, good? I sold like my then? I sold my practice and again obviously we've got to take into consideration mm. time mm. so i sold my practice at, at uh, market street for i think it was something like 250 270 thousand right. at, at that time so it's a, it's a lot of money that's at good that money time. at that time yeah. absolutely is. and bought it for a hundred yeah because i'd only paid half price really for it so i yeah. bought it for a hundred sold it for that and then just to go and you know literally give this guy a check for five grand so i could take his yeah. practice over um equipment was all old so i then went and financed new equipment, did the place up a little bit. Yeah. And slowly the two days became three days. Um, and over a period of time, we went, it was just one surgery. We went from one surgery to six surgeries. And that's, I think, where you came and started your initial courses with us. Was yep. that St. Anne's Square? Yeah, St. Anne's, it was St. Anne's. Yeah, so that was, yeah. that was the practice which Beautiful I started place. there. Yeah. <clears throat> we took on more space and expanded. Yeah. And uh, you know, pretty soon after the Eastman, <clears throat> I decided that I wanted to teach. Um, yeah, so I love the teaching part. Is this the birth of tips and training? So yeah, let's talk about that. So, first of all, what was the motivation behind that? Um, motivation was to to copy Mike. Really, I'd still got this thing in my mind, mm. which has been through throughout my life. 
is to find somebody who's successful, find somebody you can model, you'd like to be like, and copy. Mm. So from a business perspective, it made complete sense to teach. So I could show people what I could do, and I could then offer, if they wanted, for me to take on some of their difficult cases. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a natural progression to building up a referral practice was to teach dentists what they could do, what I knew um, from the Eastman, which, and the Eastman changed my life because the Eastman showed me a completely different style of dentistry. Um, the dentistry I'd been doing was, you know, basic undergraduate stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the Eastman took you by the scruff of the neck and really at that time showed you what American dentistry was like. So the Eastman was equipped um, beautifully. It had um, a lovely brand new cons floor. It had teaching teaching facilities. And the other thing it had was a, a fully equipped lab. Mm. So the way that the Eastman worked was in the morning time, you did a seminar, lasted all morning, particular topic. Um, the afternoon, you saw patients. And once you finished patients at five o'clock, you went into the lab and you worked till eight o'clock in the lab. Wow, and uh, we did all our own lab work. Mm. So a huge part of what I think my you know, success has been over the years is understanding lab work, mm -hmm. uh, being able to talk to a technician in their own language, understanding that, you know what, I've done this, so you can't pull the wool over my eyes. I know how to do this, and I've done it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to complete 50 units of crown and bridge work before we could qualify. Yeah. And that's doing it and doing the wax up, the investing, the casting, sticking the porcelain on, etc. So uh, the Eastman was run by Richard Ibbotson and Derek Setchell. Um, and their, I won't say junior staff, staff but their part-timers then that came in and taught were all trained at Michigan University. So Derek had wow. been trained at Michigan. Mm. At the time, Michigan was the center of um, occlusal studies throughout the world. So he, Derek had assembled a staff of about four or five either people he'd trained back in the UK on Michigan met methods or people who'd been to Michigan. Mm. So there was the Queen's dentist was there, um, other all totally private dentists in and around Harley Street all came in and did one or two days a week. So we had fantastic teaching, absolutely brilliant teaching. And that, again, changed my career. Mm. So I brought that style of dentistry back to manchester yeah and started teaching that and i made no bones about it i'm teaching you the uh basics of an msc an eastman msc mm -hmm. and that was the basics of my first uh 12 month course amazing and but uh, i was a lousy teacher to start off with i mean i have to tell you really this. Um, i find that very hard teaching to it yeah, yeah we, we all get nervous yeah. We all get. I still get nervous when I go on stage. It may not look as though I do, yeah. but every single time I go on stage and give a lecture, it doesn't matter if it's for 10 people or 10,000 people, yeah. I still get nervous. And I think it's like actors. If, if you lose the nerves, yeah, yeah. then you can't perform. I need that adrenaline rush of, right, come on, come on, come on. It's time no, 100%, to go. 100%, I relate to that. And, and yeah. uh, the first time I ever did a lecture, the first day, I re remember this, and you remember the first day at school and the first day, your first drive or something like that. The first time I actually taught, uh, it was a group of eight people on my first restorative course. And I was projecting onto a screen. I felt too nervous to go to the front okay. and look them in the eye. Yeah. So I lectured to them behind them with them looking at the screen. Right. Because I was just too nervous. I thought, oh, God, oh, I'm, I'm not going to do this. For, I hate doing this. And eventually, obviously, I, I got into it a bit. Oh, you said you mentioned there the first course, eight people. Yes. That's good numbers for your first course. Yeah, it was. Yeah, eight so, people did signed up to do. I'd done again from a business point of view. Yeah. I'd I'd done a few other bits and pieces. So I'll tell you about those in a minute. But I put a uh, a series of three articles into Dental Practice Magazine. Yeah. About my time at the Eastman. Okay. And so those articles for people to read were, you know, the sort of things that we've been taught at the Eastman. You know, bonded amalgams, mm. how to carve amalgams, the importance of occlusion, okay, and the importance of centric relation, retruded axis position. And that just obviously got enough people around the Northwest reading that article to think, mm, yeah, I might go and, and listen to this guy. Mm -hmm. So first course was, was eight people. Wow. So it's yeah. gone from eight people to now 
Thousands. Well, we trained, yeah, we probably Thousands. trained about 5,000 um, over the years. Um, currently, we do about 350 dentists do a one-year course with us yeah. in any of the, the four courses we do. Mm -hmm. So, it, yes, it's, it's blossomed. It, uh, it's definitely more than blossomed. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a force of nature, actually, Paul. It's, it's, it's amazing. Hi, guys. Are you thinking about getting into dental implantology? Well, if you didn't know, I'm one of the founding members of Unique Implant Training. Unique Implant Training is now in its fifth year, and we are now fully EDUCOL accredited to diploma level, which is an 18-month diploma, the only 18-month implant diploma currently in the UK. So if you want to begin your implant journey, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Find us at www.uniqueimplanttraining.co.uk. We look forward to seeing you soon. You know, I mean, I'll confess to it, because... Everything that you've just said, and uh, I hope now almost, let me see, where are we now? We're almost 14, 15 years since I first did some of your courses. Right. And I do remember that from what you said to me, that you see somebody that you copy, and I think you can probably see that <laughs> I've kind of well, copied yeah, you yeah, in many yeah, respects, yeah. Paul. Imitation yeah. is yeah. the best form of, of flattery. Yeah, well, I, I, and, and I hope you see that, that you've been a huge influence to me. But a lot of these, I mean, Dentistry now, and you mentioned when you first opened the BDJ, there's a few courses that you ring. It's now a wash with courses. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. So I'm not asking you to give away all the secrets, but in the sense there's so many academies which come and go now. Yeah. Uh, what is the secret to success? What is the secret to just being this mainstay over the last almost, well, is it three decades now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah. What's, what's, what's the difference? The f I think the first thing is that um there's a, as you, you mentioned quite a few come and go yeah um the first thing is you got to have a passion for it mm -hmm. and you got to work hard at it so you know i had a passion for uh, cricket worked hard at cricket successful uh passion for dentistry work hard at dentistry okay not just as easy as that but you've now got the building blocks to be uh successful i don't think everybody's got a passion for for teaching mm. yeah i love teaching i think it's a great profession I love to be able to go to sleep at night thinking I've helped somebody along the way mm -hmm. and I've helped a dozen, 20 people today on such and such a course. But not only that, but also hope and expect that I've also influenced them in treating another 100 patients, 200 patients. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the, the net is cast quite wide with the teaching that by teaching, you know, 10, 20 people, I'm also helping another maybe 1,000 people who are having quality dentistry rather than, let's say, mediocre dentistry. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is lots of, of people run courses and they don't realize that teaching isn't particularly profitable. No. Um, okay, you, you say no tellingly because mm -hmm. I know you, you do courses. Uh, and it's a vocation. And it's not the sort of thing that you can make huge profits out of. Mm -hmm. If I'd have spent, uh, I say this many times, if I'd have spent the same amount of time and effort in, say, banking or in the building trade or buying houses, I'd be a multi, multi, multi millionaire. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's not why I've done it. I've done it because I have a passion for what I do. Mm -hmm. And you have to have that passion for teaching. And the first thing you realize is it's a tough gig. Um, getting tougher and tougher because dentists aren't getting better trained. They're getting worse trained. Um, so they need more and more skills. Mm. Um, a lot of young dentists um, come out and they don't have not just theory, but they don't have the right hand eye skills. So um, I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done mm. uh, with them. And uh, so what's made me successful uh, experience, you know, I still do two days a week, one to two days a week anyway, of clinical dentistry, still seeing patients, still excited to do cases to help people like that. So it's experience, it's the knowledge. So I've got a deep down knowledge. And again, important that that comes with understanding the, the whole circle, uh, which includes laboratory work, mm. um, includes talking to your technician and understanding his problems. Um, so I think that's that's it. It's it's hard work. It's passion. It's understanding you're not going to be a multimillionaire from it. 
So go into it for the right reasons, in-depth knowledge, uh, experience, and keep on doing it. Mm. Keep on doing it. Yeah. So your initial love was cricket. Then obviously you're passionate about dentistry, you know, once you got into the university degree. And then the teaching almost is almost, it's almost by accident. But Yeah. 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 Oh, dentistry was by accident. Yeah. Um, and so teaching by accident. Didn't enjoy it to start off with, as yeah. I mentioned. It so was mentioned, very scary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 but persistence. Right. So, you know, because if you don't mind me saying, I think you're an excellent teacher. Thank you. Yeah. So how did you become an excellent teacher? Did you do anything to build your confidence? Build passion. Your, is it just I think it's just experience? passion. It, you know, experience com, comes in, obviously. Yeah. Um, initially, it's passion. It's passion for wanting to help people. I think people, you know, once they've been on the course, yeah, you know, most people have got a gut feeling yeah. about whether that course was there for somebody to make money on, whether that course was delivered because he had to deliver it, whether that course was delivered by somebody who had a real passion for the subject. Yeah. I think we all can go to a course and come back feeling energized or, mm, yeah, it was okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's sometimes your gut feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I, I was passionate about it. Once I got into it, then I really enjoyed people saying, a little bit like you did, then thanks, that's really changed me. That's changed my life. That's really given me a different perspective. And hearing that many, many times yeah. makes you feel good. Yeah. You know, the, it, it, all the money in the world, that makes you feel good. That lets you sleep at night. That gives you pride. You stick your chest out saying, yeah, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Sounds like to me that's the prime reason that you're still yeah. doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that reward. It is. It's that mental reward inside, that pride that says, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. I'm on the right track. Yeah, amazing. Um, just going back to the MSE, you were mentioning it's American dentistry, heavily mm. uh, influenced by obviously University of Michigan. And obviously, I know all this with the teaching that we've done, the occlusion courses. Um, were there any other influences from around the world, or is it mostly American? Is there anything from like you know Latin America, Italy, Sweden, those sorts of regions? Um, mostly American. Mostly American. Mm. Um, most of my um, further education. So after um, the Eastman, you become a bit of a, a, a junkie mm. in terms of courses. Yeah. So uh, I used to go to the states three or four times a year to Chicago midwinter meeting. Wow. Uh, Academy of, of Prosthodontics. Um, I'd go across and do the Academy of Osseointegration meeting every single year. Great fun. Meet lots of fantastic people worldwide. Um, learn an awful lot as well. But it was also fun. And I think that's the the other part of teaching. You've got to make it fun. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to you've got to make sure that those guys go away thinking, yeah, really enjoyed it. I got something. It was fun. Yeah. Um, and that's again where the passion comes out. So, uh, so I used to do all that. And when I went to the Oscar integration meeting, it was usually a three day meeting could be anywhere in the States. I'd always try and pick up if there was somebody, a big name locally that I could do a course with either before or just after. Hmm. So I'd spend seven to 10 days away rather than just flying in for three days, flying back again. Um, I had a funny incident with with david garber once and i don't know if you know the name david garber uh, yeah, yeah, but going back a few years he was one of the the top speakers on implantology mm. so we're going into probably now the late 1990s um and he had a, a beautiful practice it was david garber morris salama and henry salama of course okay yeah. one of the biggest practices um in the states and uh we'd gone i'd, I'd flown in for the uh Austria integration meeting and oh david garber's in that area oh david Gar looking not online this is in journals now uh david garber's doing the course yeah great put my name down for it three-day course um as the only participant uh, only one that turned up and so uh, david morris and henry speak to me for three days now that was tiring <laughs> tiring for them and tiring for me because there's no place to hide there wasn't anywhere where you could just hide behind somebody and just have a little doze mm. it was full on uh and learned heaps and heaps yeah, yeah. so one -one. you become a course junkie um yeah. went off to sweden did the implant noble biker course in sweden mm -hmm. so i'd say sweden and america were my influences amazing 
I think if I could just ask then, because if we could then move the conversation onto current trends and and effectively fads we were talking off air as well yeah. about how dentistry has changed and 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 well i suppose i'll tell you from my perspective when i i qualified 2004 so in the sense prepping a tooth for me was no big deal we learned crown preps yeah uh you know and uh in fact if i just go back a step further i did my elective in 2003 so as part of our final year we had to find somewhere to go for a week, like I'm sure every dental school does. Mm. And I was fortunate enough to go to NYU at the Rosenthal cool. Institute. Yeah, so it Brilliant. was. It was like smile makeovers. And I got Grimsby. Weeks. You got Grimsby? <laughs> yeah, I did a, a week's attachment in oral surgery in Grimsby. Sounds, sounds okay. fun. Not quite sounds fun. NYU. Yeah, yeah but, but NYU, um, the Rosenthal Institute, was, was a postgrad uh, yeah. uh, wing of, 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 of the institute. And it was just wall-to-wall veneers, which mm. I just... I really enjoyed it. It was two weeks of just pure watching people come in, smile, go out, yeah. just, you know, the, the emotional attachment uh, with, with cosmetic dentistry. And that stayed with me. After I qualified, I just felt there was a difference in culture between the UK and the US. And I thought it's not really going to fly here. And I bought my first practice in 2007 and it was a Nash practice. And, you know, Nash bashing for a little while. I just thought there's more to dentistry. There's more to life than just mm -hmm. this. And then that's when I fell uh, fell upon Tipton Training. And, you know, the first course I did, I did it the wrong way around. The first course I did was the aesthetics course. Okay, right. And then right. when I did the aesthetics course, I realized I know fuck all about occlusion. occlusion and then, yeah, then, 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 then I went around the house because I had to do everything. Because yeah. then it's like you said, you know, it's yeah. like a sponge. But prepping a tooth then was just no big deal. Mm. And we're learning great tooth preps. We're learning shilling bird preps. We're learning about wings. Then we're learning about zirconia because I was very, very new to dentistry then. We're learning about lithium to silicon. But we're kind of moving away from preps now. We're not. But what I'm trying to say is that the culture is, is that almost... It's the culture in the UK. In the UK, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So you, you've said that. So it's almost heresy now to prep a tooth when we have this wonderful material mm. called composite. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean... I've said a few things there. I mean, what's your perspective on that? How have you seen the industry change? And do you think that's a good thing? Do you think that's a bad thing? Um, you mentioned the word heresy. And uh, there is, there's, there's quite a big group um, that you're aware of that has the uh, anti-touch enamel group and that everything should be additive. The no okay. prep enamel brigade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you, mustn't, uh, you mustn't put down yeah. enamel. Um, I'm of the group that would suggest that it's much more important to look after the masticatory system. So what I teach is not tooth by tooth dentistry, like a lot of people do. I teach masticatory system, which is jaw joints, muscles, teeth, and ligaments. And the mm. teeth are only part of that. And sometimes you have to sacrifice some enamel for the health of the masticatory system. And we've also got to think about this part here as well, which controls everything. And it's all well and good people saying that you should never do a veneer in this case or a crown in this case. And um, there's various tests, uh, the daughter test and things like that. My daughter, one of my daughters has veneers, funny mm. enough. Um, but at the end of the day, we're dealing with a patient and we're dealing with the patient's needs wants and we have got to be cognizant of the fact that they've got a mind, they've got a brain, uh, a lot of mental health issues out there, in, in not in just in dentistry, but in the world at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the internet is can be a force for good, it can be a force for bad. Uh, and we all know that there's lots of suicides, et cetera, in young people, biggest cause of, what is it, death and males under the age of 35 is suicide. suicide. So we've got to be cognizant of the fact that a lot of people do not like their appearance. Mm. That affects their mental health, mental state. And we need to be able, in the right circumstances, to be able to help those people. And if that means taking some enamel off a tooth, then I've got no problems taking that enamel off a tooth. What it does mean is that you have to have an open mind and understand all of the different types of dentistry that can be performed on people. Um, at the moment, we've got a big trend for aligners, orthodontics. I've got no problems with orthodontics whatsoever, but orthodontics does create malocclusions. They may look very, very nice, but sometimes it creates malocclusions. 
malocclusions can create TMD problems. TMD problems, if they're not treated early enough, can become chronic, which then becomes a mental problem. So we're dropping down into this chronic pain syndrome again. So we have to be very aware of some of the new fads mm. uh, in dentistry. I'm not saying orthodontics is a fad, no. But we need to understand orthodontics from an occlusion base. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems with our teaching um, in the UK is that uh, orthodontics doesn't appear to be taught from an occlusion basis. They would argue it is with angles, classifications, so on and so forth. I think so we're forth. talking dynamic occlusion. Mm. And I think we're talking now, you know, not just, you know, how the teeth with a set of models meet, mm. but how the teeth move in lateral excursion, in protrusive movements, and how those teeth and the teeth that actually contact when we move into those areas at night time, yeah. when we brooks, how that affects the jaw joints. And I'll give you, for instance, at the moment, um, I was taught a long time ago at university, uh, orthodontics, if you had a crowded upper arch, it would be very much extract fours mm -hmm. and retract, okay? Um, the newer teaching is not about retraction, but it's about expansion. And when you expand an arch, you can expand an arch through the midline suture, and you can get some intermolar distance to align the anteriors, by expanding through the midline suture. Um, can't really do that um, with aligners that well. Mm. Um, and so how do aligners tend to get their um, interarch width to allow teeth to, to move? A lot of the time it's the intermolars which are then tipped because you can't move molars out buckly because otherwise they're gonna go out through buckle bone. Yeah. So to get space, you tip molars. Now, coming back from my occlusal point of view, yeah. as soon as you tip a molar outwards, then you're taking the buckle facing slope of the palatal cusp and you're making it steeper. Yeah. And now if somebody is gonna gr clench and grind at nighttime, there is an increased risk that they will clench and grind on that very steep slope. Because mm. remember, when we go into lateral excursions, we will slide down, which is the steepest slope in the mouth. Just so happens that most of the time it's the canines. But if you go and make a molar so it's got the steepest slope, we'll grind down that. And if we now clench and grind on that and it's close to the jaw joint, we get class two leverage and we can start to get jaw joint breakdown. Mm -hmm. So that's where the whole of dentistry, the whole of dentistry should be taught occlusion first. And then you go off to perio, endo, cons, prosthetics, orthodontics, implants. Yeah. But understanding how the masticatory system works, first of all, is paramount and, and that's where we should all be starting from no 100 percent, and uh it was eye-opening it was amazing it completely changed my whole practice once i actually understood i it. think once Everything you once you do place. understand dynamic occlusion yeah it does do you yeah. suddenly think oh wow and i'll give you for instance that uh you know most of the guys that come on our courses guys and girls they're probably in the the age range of, of uh, say 25 to 35 mm. okay and that age range a lot of people have had orthodontics when they're young. So if I have a group of, let's say, 20 dentists in front of me, okay, question I ask, how many of you have had orthodontics? Probably about seven or eight, okay? So about 40% have had orthodontics. Next question, I've been doing this now for the last 15, 20 years yeah. on every group. Next question, what percentage of you, of those eight people, have got either what you would call a malocclusion as in your teeth don't meet properly together, or you have signs and symptoms of TMD, Yeah, 50%. Mm. And that goes through every single course. Now that's not a scientific study, we know that, I know that, you know that. But it's anecdotal evidence, which is pretty strong when you go through all of these courses over the last 15 years. Yeah. So th something is happening with orthodontics that is causing occlusal problems. Mm -hmm. And if you have occlusal problems and you now clench and grind, then that can easily translate to TMD problems. No, absolutely. And you know, you ask any dentist at the moment, what's the biggest problem we're facing in dentistry? And it's probably increase in wear, increase in temporal mandibular joint problems. No, oh, absolutely. Okay, caries is still yeah, there, yeah, yeah. perio is still there, but we've got this you know, sudden, but it's it's a an increasing rise. And uh, again, I ask on the courses. 
uh, first day of the course, what percentage of your patients, your adult patients, and we go and, and list all the signs of occlusal disease. Um, and the answer comes back between 80 to 90% of their patients are suffering from some form of occlusal disease. Mm. It's not been addressed. Mm. I mean, I noticed a sharp rise. I mean, it's always been there, but after COVID, I've seen mm. tons of it. Yeah. More well, stress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but then just going back to what you were saying as well, I tell you what I'm seeing a lot of at the moment is uh, a lot of failed aligned breach bond cases yeah. as well. I'm seeing tons of it. Yeah. A lot of it's coming through. And uh, so I suppose that was the original reason for, for the question as yeah, well. Yeah. Because so this, this is... this is bonding. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's like it's very fashionable at the moment. I mean, I've seen these trends. I mean... I've I've not been around forever, but I've been around long enough now. It's almost it's my twentieth year in dentistry. Yeah. I've been around long enough to see, you know, different things become fashionable and then go. So I mean, wall to wall veneers was fashionable once upon a time. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I, I loved it. I thought it looked great. But obviously, you know, heavy preps and dentine are not a good thing. So then, you know, the whole thing about oh, we have uh, fifth generation bonding agents. You know, we can bond onto anything. Believe in that's the bond. Oh Believe my God, <laughs> yeah. what a statement. <laughs> so that's come and that's gone. Uh, and then there was a whole thing, you know, around the 2014 15 mark about short term ortho with white brackets. Seems to have disappeared. Yeah. Now we've got the Align Bleach bond culture with Invisalign, which I feel is a phase. I feel it's a phase. I mean, people would argue it's probably not, but I mm. feel it is because once all this starts to fail, which is what I'm seeing coming through the door. We're going to have to start correcting this again with ceramics. I had a great conversation with a young dentist uh, on, on, on a previous episode. And she said to me, and it was such a nice, innocent comment. It was just like, I think in the future, ceramics is going to be a thing. Really? I was like, yeah. in the future, yeah, really. ceramics is going to be a thing. I was just like, well, I think we're going yeah. full circle. Well, everything does go around full circle. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, flared jeans. I had flared jeans back in the 70s. They do <laughs> yeah. come back into a, yeah. I was just looking at a pair online, actually. I was thinking, yeah, I think it's time to get some bell bottoms again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, I well, mean, yeah. composite bonding is yeah. an interesting one. Go on. Um, again, there's a look on, on, I won't say the back of the BDJ now, but mm. look on uh, online and huge numbers of people doing composite bonding. Okay. And composite bonding, when it's done well by the people who are doing it, yeah. is fantastic. Okay, it looks beautiful. I've got to just echo that as well. I agree with you. I'm, I'm not saying there isn't a place for it. No. The, the, it, when done well, it's great. And it there are some beautiful. great people out there which are doing it's, you know, it's, great it's things. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, however, it is a highly difficult skill to teach. Um, and you know, composite itself is uh, not particularly forgiving and bonding is not forgiving. Uh, and I would say the hardest thing I ever have to do in dentistry would be one of two things. It would be either doing endo, mm -hmm. which I don't like doing. I'm not done for many years, but I found it very stressful, very hard to do. And the second thing is bonding. Mm. Okay. You've got to have everything in your favor. You soft tissue has got to be absolutely superb. Isolation has got to be superb. Um, you're then relying a lot on that dentine bond. Um, and I think we're all aware that, the dentine bond itself is the bit extra. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need enamel bonding, and the dentine bond is just that little icing on the cake. So we shouldn't just believe in the dentine bond. Believe in your bond to enamel, absolutely fine. But for every good restoration that's bonded to the tooth, we need enamel. Um, and so it's a difficult skill, and there's lots being done. But the one part again, which I'll say is being missed is the occlusion part. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I talk to my guys on the courses and I ask them, okay, how do you do your you know, edge bonding in relationship to crossover position? Mm. And the first thing, they look at me a bit dumb, what's what's crossover position? Okay, well, you know, if you've got a class one occlusion, you've got canine guidance, when you're Brooks at nighttime, as most people do at some stage in their career, maybe 30% are doing it tonight, some most people will brooks at some stage okay you can easily brooks off your canine if you don't have a deep overbite and you then go into crossover and crossover for 60 percent, 70 percent of the population is the anterior teeth mm -hmm. and so you need to make crossover positions smooth if you don't make crossover positions smooth then you'll hit on your central lateral incisors which have the composite bonding in place and it will chip and break Okay, so you've got to learn something called progressive guidance, where you progress from the canine 
onto the canine lateral and central and then finish on the lateral and central so you're progressing smoothly from one tooth to the others that means therefore for a lot of your edge bonding you need to not just put it onto the labial surface to make new composite veneers put it on the incisal edge you've got to be able to influence the palatal surface the palatal surface from intercuspal contact to incisal edge mm -hmm. so you need to overlap a lot more so you can then start to create that correct um, progressive uh, guidance and again it doesn't tend to be taught yeah. and it's a huge huge thing towards the success of composite veneers and also normal ceramic normal veneers. ceramics absolutely yeah. everything comes back occlusion 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 understanding it understanding how the masticatory system works mm -hmm. and i think we're going to have huge amounts of, of failures um i think people tend to say with composites oh well it's reversible mm. and it's not you when you take a a composite i've taken many ceramic veneers off i've taken many composite veneers off it is really really tough it takes a huge amount of time. You can't see what is composite, what is composite looting cement, what is enamel, uh, what is ceramic, without with it being wet. That's mm. number one. So you drill, you dry, you review. You drill, you dry, you review. And you have to do that. And it takes forever. And it's very, very easy to go and take away what you think is composite. And it's, in fact, it's enamel. Mm. And so to say that they're reversible, they may be reversible, maybe, mm. if it's done with high skill. But if it's not done with high skill, then a lot of enamel will be cut away when the composites are replaced. Yeah. And we all know that composite won't last forever. Okay, we look at it as a sort of five to seven year material. Some people's mouths, it stains up very rapidly. Yeah. Other people's mouths, it seems to stay pretty well. Uh, a lot of that depends on the patient. Uh, and what the patient does with their mouth. The, the younger dentists do not have the experience of having had dentistry done on themselves. I think it's really, really good for a dentist to go and be in the dental chair from time to time. It's all a case of, well, why can't we just do a digital yeah. workflow? Why yeah. can't we just make life easier for ourselves? You Unfortunately, there's, there's no shortcut. No. And this is what you know, your, your, your younger dentists need to understand. Virtual reality, augmented reality, and AI. Those are the three things that are going to be coming in. The NHS does need to keep on going in some form. And if it's to go forward in the form it is currently in, and not just become an emergency service, then we need dentists.